Welcome everyone uh, to the Open Source Data's 2021 OpenQ presentation. Uh, so we're here today just to, um, we'll be talking uh, a bit about uh, what's going on with the project and uh, a little bit about how some of our folks are using OpenQ in production. And um, so I'm, I'm Brian Sapriano. I'm a senior software engineer at Google. I am the chairperson of the OpenQ TSC and uh, one of the core developers. Um, so I'll, I'll start uh, just with a, a quick project update and share some of the some of the things we've been working on. Cool. So in the past year, uh, we've uh, been pretty busy, done, done a lot of uh, new things. Uh, I'll run through some of these now. So um, first big thing is that uh, earlier this year, we wrapped up a community user survey. Uh, this was done in partnership with the rest of the Academy Software Foundation. Um, so we did this uh, basically in order to just get a gauge on uh, what the OpenQ user community looks like and uh, how people are using the software, what kind of feature requests they're, uh, they're looking for, um, any sort of common problems they have, kind of get a sense of what people's uh, deployments and production environments look like. Um, so uh, that was great. We've been planning it for, uh, for a while, uh, but it was really nice to get a, a, you know, a, a good sense of who's out there and definitely something we want to do in the future to uh, uh, keep getting more information on the, on the folks that are out there. So, um, you know, uh, we, we very much listen to the results there. If you see a user survey come through again, uh, you know, please consider filling it out because it's uh, really good data that helps us drive uh, and plan development for, uh, for the next year. So some of the other stuff we've been working on, uh, we made some big improvements to our Windows support. Uh, that's both on the, uh, RQD with the render name inside, uh, as well as the, uh, the client side for um, for Python software. Um, that's pretty good. That's that seems like it's quite stable now. Uh, we have when folks who are using Windows in production uh, run real shows through it, and everything's looking pretty good. We've also uh, made some big improvements to our GPU support. Uh, so there was a big a big change that we that we pushed through that was um, you know basically turning GPUs into a resource more like CPUs. You know, you can have multiple GPUs, you can set uh, min and max on jobs, uh, and things like that. Uh, as more GPU jobs come, come along, we think this will start to feature much more heavily in uh, open key usage. Uh, so good to see that getting stable. Uh, and there are some more improvements that we have planned that in the future um, around platform and uh, like what kind of GPU you're using. So uh, give that a try and, and uh, let us know if uh, it's lacking some feature that you need. We did a big clean out of a lot of legacy code. Uh, you know, it's as we as we transitioned from transitioned to OpenQ from a uh, you know internal private software to open source. Uh, a lot of the uh, years of legacy code uh, kind of stayed with it. We did an initial clean out for the open source release, but there was a lot of stuff uh, still in there, and some of it was still being used. So we uh, basically did a big project to help shift folks off uh, any of that legacy code and then, and then clean it out. Uh, the big one here is Oracle support. Uh, when, we, when we launched, we initially had support for Oracle and Postgres. Um, you know, we've basically been trying to uh, get rid of the, or the Oracle support because it was not being used and supporting multiple database options was, um, you know, basically really limiting development of OpenQ. Um, it's, uh, you know, as especially because our scheduler right now is so database driven, um, it was making any changes to that very difficult because you had to basically make the changes twice. Uh, so uh, good to get that out and that's unblocked a lot of uh, a lot of future development uh, now that we only have to support the one engine. Um, and all the folks who were using Oracle have shifted under Postgres now and, and seem to be quite happy with it. Um, so that's good. Uh, we've done a big, uh, we've done many Kind of small GUI fixes and, and new features, such as a GUI for creating new shows. Um, you know, as more and more productions have run through OpenQ, uh, you know, we found little bits and pieces that needed to be fixed there. Um, so, overall, the GUI should be much more stable than it than it used to be, um, and has has some new features that kind of fill some uh, some some big gaps, like being able to create new shows, uh, things that previously you had to do via the uh, the command line tool. Uh, we've done a done a bunch of work uh, to um, 
support new Python versions. So basically that the task there was to upgrade a lot of the dependencies that we were using. Uh, so we are happy to say that we now support uh, up to Python 3.9. So that's basically Python 2.7 up through 3.9. Um, and that includes the, uh, the VFX reference platform for the current year, of course. Uh, so we are currently looking at uh, the draft of next year's reference platform and preparing to support that as well. Um, that one uses Python 3.9, so we don't really anticipate many issues there. Um, we have done a lot of work to expand our testing infrastructure. Um, that includes kind of general CI jobs, but also unit test uh, code coverage. Uh, that's up to up to 55% now. Um, you know, we still have more work to do to get that higher. Uh, it, basically, that 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 extra 25% covers tens of thousands of lines of code. Uh, you know, including uh, a lot of the, the GUI code, which uh, is a big, a big portion of what OpenCube contains. Uh, so. Uh, that that's been a big benefit, and we're able to um, basically merge PRs and and uh, cut new releases now with uh, a lot more confidence. We release support for uh, metrics exporting and, and dashboard with uh, Prometheus, Grafana, Loki. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in the sec in a sec because uh, we are pretty happy with all how that turned out. Um, so I'll go into more detail on that. And yeah, just lots of lots of bug fixes and improvements. Uh, 172 PRs merged in the past year. Um, just uh, as more production uh, users come onto the system, um, there's just been a lot of uh, a lot of little stuff that folks have picked up, fixed up, or or um, improved as they needed. And it's been great to see these kind of small changes uh, come in. So uh, all of this is included in that uh, the new release that we just published, 014.5. Uh, so you can check that out. And uh, yeah, just some, some stats on who's contributing to OpenQ. We now have 33 unique contributors. Um, seven of those folks are committers, meaning they can, uh, they can do code review, approve PRs, merge code, that kind of thing. And our TSC has is, is, uh, grown to 10 members as well. Uh, many of those folks are committers too. So yeah, over the upcoming year, uh, some of the big things that we want to focus on, you know, uh, there's a lot of small stuff on here as well. Um, and our roadmap on GitHub uh, has uh, a lot, a lot more in it. Um, but these are kind of the big pieces that uh, have started already. Uh, so one thing is uh, we're going to be publishing our Python packages to PyPI. Uh, right now, the, the Python uh, installation process is uh, way more complicated than it, than it needs to be. It's kind of non-standard using uh, setup.py, that kind of thing. Um, so we're going to be publishing the PyPI and, and as part of that, doing a, a large kind of code and config cleanup uh, to make it easier to uh, configure OpenQ once you've installed it, since we're kind of moving away from the model where a lot of folks will have the source checked out. Uh, so that'll be a, a big benefit to uh, folks, especially who are just setting up OpenQ for the first time. We are at, kind of related. We're planning a big docs refresh. Uh, we, we published a few new user guides, but um, but more are coming, especially for the, the big components like the GUI software. Uh, so that's coming along. Uh, configuration guides for how to configure each component. And uh, we also have we also want to uh, keep publishing kind of tutorials. We just published one, which I'll share with you in a moment. And, and we want to do uh, more of those, basically highlighting different features of OpenQ, especially as we uh, release new features. We want to kind of highlight what's changed and how to use it and all that. Uh, one one big piece of development that we have uh, that we are in the early stages of Rio is a schedule rewrite. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the OpenQ uh, scheduling is database driven. Uh, we kind of want to move away from this model. It's something we've been talking about for a while, but the uh, the Oracle support was kind of blocking that because uh, moving away from that and having to do the work in two different database engines was uh, was going to cause some issues. So uh, I think. You know, the idea is we want to move to more of a in, in memory type model, um, which, uh, you know, will help uh, will help expand the schedule a lot to allow folks to uh, customize it and uh, customize scheduling logic, uh, tune things to their liking, that sort of thing. Uh, so we are currently gathering requirements for that. Uh, we'd love to hear from folks uh, if they have, you know, 
either current issues with the scheduler or um, would like to see any new things when we do the rewrite. Uh, there is a GitHub issue that started for discussion here, which is which is linked here, and, and uh, we'll be posting these slides later. Um, to uh, we'd love to get your feedback on that. The other thing we've been talking a lot about is expanded cloud support. Uh, we did some basic work as part of the uh, the Google Summer of Code uh, last year, um, but we'd like to build on that a lot. I think right, you know, the initial uh, plugin that we we're working on was very manual and we'd like to uh, introduce some better hooks for uh, uh, hooking this into your cloud setup. Um, you know, we uh, plan to support all the major clouds and uh, more basically more info on that as it comes. We're in the we're in the early stages of that now. Yeah, so um, so that's kind of what's been going on in the project. I, I did want to talk a little bit more about the monitoring stack that we um, recently released support for. Um, this is basically meant as a sample. Um, you know, a lot of folks are using these tools already, uh, but, so we wanted to kind of show a sample deployment and let folks build on that to, to merge it into uh, their main production setup. Uh, so this is published in the OpenG Master branch as a Docker Compose setup, um, and which will let folks stand it up quickly and play around with it, and then uh, they can kind of look at the config files that we've shared and uh, customize that further and um, merge that merge that in. So that has a few main components. Uh, all of the OpenQ components are in that sandbox or set up to uh, send logs to Loki. Um, metrics for the database and for the QBot are sent into Prometheus. And then we have some uh, some Grafana dashboard set up to to browse all that stuff, uh, which uh, will let you you know set up your own dashboard, set up alerting, that kind of thing. So we've included a couple of example dashboards for uh, for the database and for the QBot. Um, just kind of a some brief info on on how that works. Um, again, you know we'll we'll share these links later, but. Um, you know, there's basically a follow our follow our existing quick start, which will help you stand up the OpenQ sandbox, uh, and then we have another guide which we've recently published that will help you stand up the uh, the sandbox plus the monitoring stack. Um, so it's pretty pretty simple, uh, just a Docker compose command. There are some prerequisites to set up, but um, once once that's done, just Docker compose to stand it up, and uh, that'll uh, give you a Grafana deployment to log into and start playing around with. Um, this is what it looks like once you do stand it up. Uh, you can see we've uh, just included a couple of these sample dashboards and uh, config files for that are in the code repository to, to build on. Uh, this is an example of what the QBot um, metrics look like. You can see it shows, uh, basically shows performance of the system, you know, how, how well the uh, booking and dispatching is working. Uh, are things waiting in the queue for a long time? Is dispatching done efficiently? Um, that sort of stuff. And this is an example of the, the Postgres um, metrics. Um, pretty familiar if you've uh, had a Postgres deployment before, but uh, just shows database uh, performance and, you know, helps, helps you see if there's heavy load on the system or if things need tuning or that sort of thing. Um, and in addition to this, there are also, um, you know, you could also set up things like alerting on alerting when logs come in or um, capturing uh, specific errors in the logs, that kind of thing uh, from Loki. So that is it for me. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to Diego Tavares from Imageworks, who will talk a bit more about how SPI is using um, OpenQ in their production deployment. That's right. So I'm Diego Tavares, lead software engineer at Imageworks, and I'm the responsible for the team that manages OpenQ internally. And I'll be speaking a little bit about how was our road to production. Coming from Q3, which was the tool that initiated the whole OpenQ project and migrating all of our productions to OpenQ. And since November last year, we are running everything on OpenQ. So all of our productions are fully rendered on OpenQ. And example of that, examples of that, we have Vivo coming up this Friday. Make sure you watch it on Netflix, it's worth it. We had the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Mitchells versus the Machines, Hotel Transylvania, Transformania, also coming up soon, finally back in theaters. 
And OpenQ was able to manage more than six productions simultaneously. And that's only possible using the subscription allocation model. And if you want to learn more about how the model works, we have that on the documentation, but in that's the link for it. But that basically allows productions to distribute a number of cores and how their infrastructure will be distributed between different productions. And all of that was possible using only three Qbot instances. Qbot is our server side uh, module, and we have that under a load balancer. So everything is balanced between the three Qbot nodes. But if necessary, we can scale that up or down. And to accomplish that, we are using an infrastructure of more than 50,000 cores, and they are all fully managed by OpenQ. And with, with such a big infrastructure uh, plugged into OpenQ, we learned a few lessons. And the main lesson is that for such a big infrastructure, tuning is required to get the best performance. That doesn't mean that OpenQ out of the box doesn't work well. It does work very well out of the box. But for big productions and to get the best performance, some tuning is required. And that tuning requires some time to learn the basics and to understand how data flows into OpenQ. And this, by tuning, I mean parameters such as the size of thread pools. We, had different, we have different thread pools, so we, which thread pool should have more cores and things like that. And to make that possible, we used the Grafana monitoring tools that are integrated on OpenQ. And that helped a lot because doing that based on logs only would be impossible. So using monitoring tools was very useful for us to understand where bottlenecks are and to target uh, tuning those parts of the system first. And one of the features that uh, our team likes the most in our setup is being able to deploy uh, new versions with no downtime. So imagine having having to deploy a new version and having to stop the whole production to put that on, to put, put the new version live. That will be a no-show a no, a no for us. And we are able now to deploy a new version with no, no impact, no, without users even noticing that something changed. And that is only possible because we are running everything under our CI CD uh, pipeline integrating to GitLab. This way, we, before deploying, we have all the tests executed. We, we can be certain that everything is running fine and that can go live using Docker Swarm. And with, as we have more than one instance, everything is deployed in a way that we can roll back if something bad happens, because sometimes it does happen. And as I mentioned, the Grafana boards, we have Grafana boards for two different people in the company. We have boards for developers and board for resources and productions. And for developers, the boards are focused on monitoring the internal parts of the system, such as the thread pools. So this is one example. We can see the number of jobs that are being rejected in each of our uh, nodes to monitor if we, have, we are having some problems or some bottlenecks happening in one of the, the, the services. And we can also see, also see the booking capacity and how that evolves but we don't want to be monitoring that all the time. So we have Grafana alerts so where we can set certain thresholds. So if something goes above a threshold, we will get an email alerting the whole team and someone can simply jump in and see what's happening. And if some action is required before users actually notice a problem because we are monitoring thresholds and we can tune those thresholds to identify problems before they become uh, showstoppers. And we also have uh, some general uh, service stats monitoring. So like here, we can see the status, uh, the number of jobs in frames per status. This way we can identify certain peaks or certain times where we had more jobs than expected and how the system behaved with that. So the number of threads that were spawned given that load or if that load is causing more impact than we were expecting. And that enabled us to tune the parameters in a way that was based on, not on in-guessing, but seeing the data, tuning, and checking the impact of our changes on, this, on, the, on the data that we see. And we also have boards for the production and resources team. And their main focus in the, uh, using the boards 
is to see how well distributed our infrastructure is between shows. So they can see the number of cores they're running per show. And by this, they can tell if a show it's maybe starving, a bigger show is starving a smaller show and distribute the infrastructure in a way that all shows are running and they are running accordingly to their load and to their size. And they also can see the number of jobs that are running a total at a certain time. And that's important to see if we are, if the whole facility is under pressure because multiple shows are in a part of the of their of their flow that is requiring more cores than we have. And this way we can set up our scheduling in a way that we don't have all the shows running through throttle at the same time. And one last feature that I want to highlight, it's how simple our Python tree API is. And to exemplify that, we had a hackathon internally on Imageworks last month. It was a single day hackathon and two engineers with zero OpenQ experience, they had never touched the OpenQ API and they were able to build a plugin, a shotgun plugin to gather data for OpenQ, from OpenQ, display that data, integrate that data with shotgun data and also modify uh, open queue jobs from uh, shotgun and in a single day for two, for two engineers. And this is one example of one of the boards they built on shotgun. They're able to see the infrastructure distribu distribution per shot or even how many shots are running per CG sup, sup, sup for CG supervisor. Another example here is uh, being able to group jobs by sequence and seeing the percentage of the sequence that is completed and fully rendered, or even by tasks. So they created uh, tasks and users are able to manually allocate tasks to uh, jobs to tasks and able to see the duration of those tasks or how long that took to be rendered or to be processed. And one example of how simple and well-documented it is, we don't have the documentation published inside of Matrix. So all, of, all that those engineers had access to was the, the code documentation. So simply importing OpenQ API and asking help in any of the methods, they're able to see what the method does and all the arguments. And in a way that it's simple enough to from by method from method to from one one method to another they are able to navigate and build what they want and what they need without requiring help so I, I didn't have to help them at any time so they were able to build that by themselves only using the documentation and that's it uh, here we have our resources link if you want to be part of OpenQ of the development of OpenQ or if you want to become a user follow those links and we will be happy to reach out to you if you have any questions. Yeah, so that, thanks Diego. Um, so that, uh, that last slide just shows, um, you know, includes some of the basic resources like the repository, the users list, um, and that monitoring sandbox that I talked about, the, that link leads to a user guide for how to get it all set up. Um, so give that a try if you're interested in uh, seeing OpenQ within your, uh, within your studio's Grafana setup. Cool, so I think uh, that is it for the main presentation and now we'll move on to some Q&A. Um, so feel free to drop in the chat. Um, looking at it now and we've got, got a question here. Um, let's see, this is for Imageworks says for deployment are using blue green deployment with circuit breakers, canary deployments, dark launches, or something else to keep renders running and uh, not losing render running jobs in progress. Um, so Diego, if you want to take that one. Mm, I wouldn't say we are using blue green deployments, but we are using let me see how to answer that. So the way OpenQ works, uh, we are able to deploy to, we have three instances and we are able to deploy a new version to one of the instances only and wait for that instance to come back online. 
then proceed to the next one, and then to the next one. Of course, that's all automated. And the way OpenKey was designed, RQD, which is the module that runs on the render nodes, uh, RQD, it's able to keep running even if he doesn't have access to the server and you keep trying to reach out to the server and it doesn't need to reach the, to reach the same server. So if the server, the RQD was connected the, by the first time, gets offline, you will connect to the second server and be able to continue to run and to update its status on the application. So scalability, it's the answer for this in our, in our side. One, one thing I wanted to add um, relating to the um, API documentation that Diego was talking about. Um, yeah, we have done a lot of work in the API code to make sure that that's well documented. And, um, you know, like he said, we haven't published a reference to the openq.io website uh, yet because we're working out exactly how that published workflow will work. But uh, we do have instructions on our website for building a copy of the API reference locally. Um, so there's a environment you can set up and, um, basically generate the HTML. So uh, that'll give you a, uh, an API reference that's based on the exact version that you're using at that moment, uh, which, which is pretty nice. Okay, we've got another question for SBI. Uh, are you deploying OpenQ via GitLab, CI, CD, using Kubernetes, Docker Compose, or just on VM, bare metal? So right now we have uh, the deployment running on VMs using Docker Swarm. So we have a Docker Swarm set up with all the VMs that we, we need and the deployments are managed by GitLab CI CD. So for now we are not using Kubernetes, but we are experimenting with it. Let's see any other questions? Uh, here we have one that says, uh, anyone using OpenQ with Windows nodes in production? Um, the answer to that is yes. And uh, I know that we have a, a couple of users who have done that. Um, let's see, Diego, anything to add to that? Yeah, we had one production that used Windows on, on OpenQ. And it was used on production and for a, a, a show that's already completed so we worked fine we had to do some tricks and fixes to make that work and after that everything's working but today we are in a in a point where windows nodes can run as well as rqd as linux rqd nodes Question, uh, can you tell what the use case was for Windows? Unreal Engine was used in our case, but not for everything, just for some specific uh, Unreal jobs that we needed to run on OpenQ. Um, see if, if a rewrite of the scheduler is on the development timeline are existing open source schedulers being considered for the replacement um i think pretty pretty much everything's on the table right now we haven't really narrowed down the uh the options uh, we wanted to start with kind of a um you know stating the existing problems developing a list of requirements and then letting that kind of shape what we uh what we choose later um 
you know, anything that will fit the requirements that we develop is, is something that we would consider definitely. Um, so yeah, if you have a suggestion, uh, definitely go to the, uh, the discussion thread that I've linked in these slides and uh, we'd, we'd be happy to hear it. Uh, question, what is the current progress on license tracking? Um, yeah, so we, we do have, base, it's, called a, it's called limits within OpenQ. Uh, we have a, a limit system that's set up. Uh, so this lets you define kind of any, like an arbitrary limit. Uh, I think licensing was the, was the primary use case here, um, but it basically will let you say, okay, I need to have, I can only have 50 RL jobs running at a time and then OpenQ will enforce that and, and make sure that um, you don't go beyond that count. Uh, the only, th the one thing there that's, um, I don't know, it may be lacking is that it's not receiving like live data from a license server or anything like that. So it is maintaining the count on its own and um, um, only kind of considering what's going on within OpenQ. Uh, so there is uh, some room for improvement there, but um, basically the, from the folks that we've talked to using the limits has, uh, has basically helped them uh, enforce licensing requirements. Um, see, uh, question, uh, sorry, this is wrong presentation. Any plans for Q admin web UI and user permission authentication? Yeah, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the Q admin tasks, or at least some subset of the Q admin tasks are available within the, the main Q GUI software. Um, so, you know, like uh, the GUI for creating new shows um, that, I, that I talked about. Um, so we are looking to kind of build on the uh, existing GUI software rather than uh, creating a new, a totally new app. Um, so over time, more, you'll see more of that uh, show up in, uh, in Q GUI. Um, and related, yeah, for, the, the, the kind of drawback to that is that because there, because there isn't much uh, permission enforcement within OpenQ right now, um, that would expose more kind of admin level functionality to the uh, to your your user base, um, which I, I'm guessing is why the, the user permission and authentication comes in there. Um, and you know, basically, yes, we do we do have uh, um, you know user permissions and authentication that is on our roadmap. Um, we don't have any, uh, we don't really have a concrete deadline for that yet. Uh, we know that we'd like to work on it, um, but you know, from the development pool that we've had, um, I think folks have kind of picked up things and there was some more interest in the schedule of rewrites. So that's what we went with first. Um, but that is definitely on the top of our minds and something that, that we'd like to work on um, as soon as there are some cycles available for it. Question, are there plans for supporting or already support for displaying a different taxonomy in the GUI? For example, if a shop wanted to replace shows with analyses or some other domains language. Um, that's an interesting idea. I, I don't think we have any plans for that right now, um, but I, I think I see where this is going, which is if you're using OpenQ for something other than um, the kind of primary media use case, um, you know, OpenQ works great as a kind of general purpose scheduler. You know, it's kind of agnostic to what software is being run. Um, it will run kind of any anything that you could run on the, on the command line on the render nodes uh, can be distributed through OpenQ. I know lots of folks in production are using it for kind of non-rendering tasks, like for example, doing um, you know, doing archiving or cop yeah, copying files to different places, that kind of thing, syncing things to the cloud. Um, so it will work for that. Uh, the the only downside is, yeah, the terminology that's being used is, is used is quite specific uh, to the rendering use case. Um, so, um, yeah, that that's an interesting idea and and something we'll we can talk about as in the steering committee.
Any other questions? We've got a few minutes left before the end of the session. Okay, great. Um, I think we can wrap it up then. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Um, you know, we'll, like I said, we'll post these slides and uh, you know, please check it out and um, feel free to write us on the user lists. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy to chat more there. Um, we also have the Slack through the uh, the ASWF Slack if you'd like to reach us that way. So, thanks, okay. thanks so much.